evolution is the unifying principle of modern biology, bringing together one seemingly unconnected fields like biogeography and ecology, embryology and paleontology, and the study of heredity, what we now call genetics, into a holistic, synthetic framework. Despite this, evolutionary biologists have not always been unified in their understanding of evolution. Indeed, for most of the history of evolutionary thinking, there have existed intense, even acrimonious disputes over the driving forces of evolution. Not only that, but by 1910, Darwinian natural selection was stunningly close to being discarded as a theory of evolution. In this video, I want to talk about the human part of science. We often think of science as being above the fray, above the politics and social issues of the day, but that is of course nonsense. Science doesn't exist outside of scientists, and scientists are humans that are shaped by their external environments, both social and political. Science has historically been performed by those who had the wealth and time to do it, and while more people can do science today than in the past, their ability to do science is still contingent on convincing those with the wealth to fund them. In this way, science is an economic force in addition to being an engine of discovery. Scientific investigations and discoveries are often pitched in this light. What new technology can it offer humans? How can it improve our health? How can it permit us to grow more nutritious crops, etc.? Human interests, even arbitrary ones, clearly drive the scientific enterprise. For example, the vast majority of multicellular life on this planet are invertebrates. And yet, most biologists study vertebrates, a large portion of which study specifically mammals. Indeed, there are more mammal biologists than there are species of mammals. People study mammals not because they represent some important part of biodiversity. Objectively, they are more of an anomaly than some impressive trend given how species poor the group is, but because we're mammals. We understand them. We feel kinship to them. The same is, unfortunately, not true of crustaceans or nematodes, despite these being far more important members of their communities, both historically and today. My point is that what we decide to study, what we decide to fund, are all tied into human wants and desires. I'm not saying that our results are biased by this, or that what we discover isn't true, but that our own humanity often causes us to have a narrow view of the world. We are drawn to concepts such as progress. We like notions of purpose and determinism. We like to categorize things into neat boxes. We like to imagine the biological world as being composed of species all interacting in a kind of harmonious fashion. But there's nothing inherently true or biological about any of these ideas. They are human conceptions that often cloud us from the truth. These same human shortcomings, if you will, impacted the historical development of evolutionary theory. The simplified history you may be familiar with goes something like this. Darwin took a boat trip around the world, saw some finches, and came up with natural selection as the driving mechanism of evolution. Then we rediscovered Mendel in the early 1900s, and biologists came together and unified Darwinian natural selection with Mendel's laws to generate the modern synthesis. You may also have some notion that since its founding we've added things to the original synthesis, and now it's grown into some broader thing that itself accounts for all sorts of change, including epigenetic changes and niche construction. But this historical view lacks nuance. Importantly, it dismisses dissenting voices, which have been incredibly influential over the course of the development of evolutionary theory. Beyond that, intensely acrimonious feuds between competing viewpoints actively set back evolutionary theory for a solid decade because neither side was willing to budge. Some of these were so intense that various researchers were afraid to change their positions because they thought they'd lose their funding. 
Beyond this, there's this trend among biologists to try and absolve the early theorists of their roles in the eugenics movements, including Darwin himself, the idea being that these men were just products of their time. But that view seems at odds with the off-sided notion that science is above politics. The view of the eugenicist, as I will discuss in detail, were accepted as scientific. Is science then just a product of its time as well? My point here is that science can't simultaneously claim to stand above the fray and yet consistently insert itself into it. And even if it could pretend that it was standing outside, it will inevitably get dragged back in because, as I said, science is an economic enterprise that influences and is influenced by society. My purpose in this video is not to try and say that science is somehow just a social construct that is incapable of discovering anything true, but rather that scientific achievement is often made via a struggle between hotly contested positions that can take decades to resolve and that much of the disagreements may not be data-driven at all, but driven by personality cults. The incredible thing about science is that it manages to discover things about the natural world in spite of the shortcomings of the humans involved. The title of this video, A People's History of Darwinism, is of course inspired by the great historian Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States. Like Zen, I intend to tell a bit of a different narrative than you might have heard, focusing on parts of the history not often told. Throughout, I will be highlighting the shortcomings, both scientific and ethical, of the characters involved in hopes to demonstrate that science is a human enterprise. Again, this isn't to disparage science, but merely to humanize it. Uh, for myself, science is deeply personal. It's a thing I've dedicated my life to, and to strip the human component is to miss at least half of what it is. The title is also quite literal. I want to tell the story of the development of Darwinism through the eyes of the people instead of strictly the science. We will start with Darwin and his inspirations, and then we will move into the major disputes of the late 19th and early 20th centuries in which Darwin's ideas were very close to being discarded entirely. We will talk about the incredibly heated and public debates surrounding the acceptance of Mendelian inheritance that almost came to literal fistfights. We will end with what I consider the death of Darwinism, leading up to the birth of Neo-Darwinism and the modern synthesis. To learn more about the Neo-Darwinian synthesis, check out my video on Evolution's Trinity, linked in the description below. Without further ado, let's get started with the man himself, Charles Darwin. Let's begin with the development of Darwin's theory of natural selection. A common misconception is that social Darwinism is the application of Darwin's ideas to economics. In reality, Darwin was bringing economic and political thought to nature. Let's ask ourselves a simple question. Why, in a world where we'd already discovered many of the fundamental laws of physics and chemistry, did it take until the 1930s for someone to start hinting at the idea of natural selection? Natural selection is deceptively simple, so much so that T.H. Huxley famously wrote, quote, how extremely stupid not to have thought of that. A few obvious social and economic changes were taking place in Europe in the late 1700s, the clearest being the Industrial Revolution. Charles Darwin was born into a very wealthy family. His grandfather, Josiah Wedgwood, is the founder of the Great Wedgwood Pottery Company that still exists in Great Britain today. Josiah coined many of the terms typically associated with business, such as the money-back guarantee, or buy one, get one free, uh, direct mail advertising, etc. Darwin's father, Robert Darwin, married into the Wedgwood family at the behest of his father, Erasmus, who was Josiah's business partner. Robert Darwin inherited a great fortune from Josiah and Erasmus and invested it in housing, uh, the trend in Mercy Canal, and various other infrastructure projects. 
He was also trained as a physician with a large and well-established practice by the time he married into the Wedgwood family. Alongside the rise of industrial capitalism was, of course, the many political theories that sought to explain it. Perhaps the most influential was Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which stressed the importance of free market competition and saw capitalism as a natural system. In the struggle for capital, some companies will inevitably fail. In the struggle for the means of subsistence, some individuals will have fewer skills and thus have less valuable labor, leading inevitably and naturally to poverty. Thomas Malthus used this concept in his 1798 work, An Essay on the Principle of Population. In this essay, he noted that humans, on average, have far more offspring than what our current production of food can sustain. Yet there exists natural checks, if you will, keeping the population from growing out of control. These include disease, war, and famine. That is, the mortality rate cancels the excess birth rate. Malthus would argue for the gradual abolition of poor laws in England that were meant to protect against this increased death rate. Regardless of how it happened, though, Malthus viewed population size as regulated by some hand. Something natural was elevating the strong and weeding out the weak in society, and by weak, of course, he meant poor, much the same way as Smith saw competition as driving the success of some businesses at the expense of others. The relationship between these ideas and natural selection should be blatantly obvious. The world of industrial capitalism was the one in which Charles Darwin was raised. He kept up with the stock reports each morning before going about his experiments and writing. He cited Malthus's work as an inspiration, seeing in nature the same things that Malthus had proposed in human economics. The connection is clear from the way that Darwin argued for natural selection in Origin of Species. One, that organisms have far more offspring than can live to reproduce. This is Malthus's notion of geometric population growth. Two, that there exists variation in natural populations and that some of that variation is heritable. And three, that some of that variation provides an advantage, allowing those possessing it to leave more offspring. This is reminiscent of Adam Smith's notion of competition in a free market. Left to a state of nature, some come out on top and some fail. To reiterate, Darwin was applying economic theories of his time to nature. He was not the first biologist to draw inspiration from political theory, and certainly not the last, as we will soon see. The concept of social Darwinism is often attributed to the polymath Herbert Spencer, who dabbled in political theory, biology, and sociology in his writings. But it's important to note that Spencer wrote about evolution in 1851 in his book Social Statics, eight years before Darwin's Origin of Species. In this work, he laid out his view that society and culture evolved, and that over the course of time, we'd evolve such sociality as to no longer need to be governed, and the government would just wither away. It's perhaps telling to the historical case I'm trying to make that we all know the term survival of the fittest, which Spencer coined in 1863 to describe the Darwinian mechanism, which Darwin himself would later adopt in further editions of Origins, but few of us know the phrase mutual aid. In a series of essays between 1890 and 1896, the Russian naturalist and political theorist Peter Kropotkin proposed that Darwin's mechanism of natural selection didn't necessarily imply universal competition and struggle. Instead, organisms could be selected to work together. For example, many species, including humans, are quite social, living in large groups in which individuals regularly interact. If all of those interactions were competitive in a strictly survival of the fittest kind of way, living in groups would be disadvantageous. The more individuals you're around, the more competition you have. But what if you cooperated with each other, say, by sharing food? If I share food with you when you have none, in the future you may be more likely to share food with me when I have none. In doing so, both of us gain fitness because we have food when we otherwise wouldn't. 
Hence, natural selection can favor cooperation and reciprocity as easily as it can struggle and competition. Of course, these ideas are now part of mainstream evolutionary thinking, but they didn't become well established until ethologists like W.D. Hamilton proposed kin selection and Maynard Smith introduced evolutionary game theory, itself borrowed from economics. But for half a century, Kropotkin's ideas were ignored both because of his politics, he was an anarchist and a communist, and because the Industrial Revolution had instilled in the minds of Western naturalists the supremacy of competition over cooperation. Now, I want to mention here an important point about the history of evolutionary thinking. We all know Darwin was not the one who came up with evolution, but what is perhaps less well appreciated is that Western thought at the time was already flirting pretty hard with the idea. Many prominent intellectuals publicly endorsed the idea of evolution, including Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus. In 1844, the book Vestiges on the Natural History of Creation, which was published anonymously by the Scottish naturalist Robert Chambers, was a huge hit and a bestseller when it first published. Abraham Lincoln read the book and gave it high marks, and Prince Albert would read it to Queen Victoria in the afternoons. The strongest reactions to vestiges came from the clergy and, ironically, other naturalists. Adam Sedgwick, the famed geologist and Darwin's teacher, thought the book vile, writing to Charles Lyell, quote, If the book be true, the labors of sober induction are in vain. Religion is a lie. Human law is a mass of folly and a base injustice. Morality is moonshine. Our labors for the black people of Africa were works of madmen. And man and woman are only better beasts. I cannot but think the work is from a woman's pen. It is so well dressed and so graceful in its externals, I do not think the beast man could have done this part so well. Wrapped up in Sedgwick's review is my exact point. He refused to entertain the idea of evolution because it clashed not with science, but because it upset his worldview, his gentlemanly sensibilities. He, like most other naturalists, had read and studied William Paley's natural theology that had explained so clearly that organisms were designed by an intelligent mind, a creator not developed by nature. Of course, before even vestiges was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's 1809 zoological philosophy in which he proposed the mechanism of soft inheritance and the principle of use and disuse. Lamarck's writings made little impact in France at the time. He was famously rebuked by Georges Escuyer. But when Chambers reintroduced his ideas in vestiges, they had a big impact on later evolutionary thinking, including Darwin, Huxley, and Spencer. All of this is to say that the world was primed to hear Darwin's take on evolution. The idea of organic evolution was being discussed all across the Western world, but it had yet no mechanism to explain it. So, in 1809, Darwin's theory of natural selection provided that needed mechanism, and it became widely accepted among naturalists. Or so you've heard. The reality was much messier, to the point that by the 1900s, Darwinian natural selection had fallen out of favor and teetered on the edge of the dustbin of history. While Darwin's work led to an overwhelming acceptance of evolution sort of writ large, it's unclear how many people initially accepted natural selection. The mechanism was appealing to some, but many struggled to see how it could work including T.H. Huxley, despite being Darwin's bulldog. The hesitancy was based on two features. First, the prevailing view of inheritance at the time was blending theory. That is, children are a blend of traits that exist in their parents. How could natural selection act on a trait that was blended away each generation? Second was Darwin's insistence that evolution was very slow and gradual operating on very slight, continuous variation between individuals. This latter point frustrated Huxley, who wrote Darwin, urging him to broaden his views to include discontinuous evolution, or leaps, if you will, instead of just strict, gradual change. 
The man responsible for one of the largest schisms in evolutionary thought was Francis Galton, Darwin's half-cousin. You may know Galton as the father of scientific racism. He coined the term eugenics and advocated for superior races to gradually supplant inferior ones, including a bizarre letter to the Times in 1873 titled Africa for the Chinese, in which he argued that the Chinese should be shipped to Africa so that they could over time replace the quote, lazy savages. Seriously, you should go read that letter. It's one of the weirdest pieces of history I've ever encountered, and it should be telling that this man was considered a world-renowned intellectual in his day. Galton also influenced Darwin's work considerably, and several chapters of Descent of Man was inspired by Galton's work on human differences in Hereditary Genius, published in 1869. In this work, Galton argued that genius was inherited, that sons whose fathers were highly intelligent were also more likely to be intelligent. He wrote, quote, The natural ability of genius is such as a modern European possess in a much greater average share than men of lower races. There is nothing in the history of domestic animals or in that of evolution to make us doubt that a race of sane men may be formed who shall be as much superior mentally and morally to the modern European as the modern European is to the lowest of the Negro races. It's important here to consider the context that, that prompted Galton to this work. He writes, quote, The human mind was popularly thought to act independently of natural laws and to be capable of almost any achievement, if compelled to exert itself by a will that had a power of initiation. Galton, in Hereditary Genius and also later in Natural Inheritance and Fingerprints, argue that the human mind is constrained by inheritance, and thus there will always be a race of men with superior intelligence. I cannot stress here enough that Galton was not seen as a crank. Alfred Russell Wallace praised hereditary genius in his review, stating it, quote, will take rank as an important and valuable addition to the science of human nature. Darwin, in a letter to Galton, wrote, quote, I do not think I ever in all of my life read anything more interesting and original, and how well and clearly you put every point. I should also note that Darwin's Descent of Man is a deeply divisive text. 2021 was the 150th anniversary of its publication, and several articles were published denouncing it as a work of racism, sexism, and colonialism, which it is all of those things. It even has some weirdly patriotic rhetoric about how great the Anglo-Saxon race is, and hence how great England is. He writes in the chapter titled Civilized Nations, quote, The remarkable success of the English as colonists, compared to other European nations, has been ascribed to their daring and persistent energy. Obscure as is the problem of the advance of civilization, we can at least see that a nation which produced during a lengthened period the greatest number of highly intellectual, energetic, brave, patriotic, and benevolent men would generally prevail over less favored nations. His section on sexual selection made clear that he was a typical Victorian male. He wrote that women were obviously less intelligent than men, and here he cites Galton's hereditary genius as supplying the evidence for this. At the same time, dissentive man bucked some of the prevailing views about the origins of human races, strongly supporting the idea that all humans descend from a common ancestor, as opposed to the multiple origins idea that was prominent at the time, and further that the different human races did not represent distinct subspecies as they shared as many traits, and there were clear gradations of traits that connected the races. Not only was Darwin inspired by Galton, but in many ways, Galton is more the father of modern evolutionary theory than Darwin is. In fact, one of his students, Carl Pearson, who we will talk about shortly, believed that Galton would be remembered as an even larger figure in evolution than Darwin. 
Galton's contributions to evolutionary thinking are vast, but I think the reason no one today associates him with modern evolutionary theory is because it's very difficult to kind of disentangle his deeply racist views from his scientific contributions. Indeed, these racist views informed how he did his science, and thus his science informed his views in this sort of self-confirming way. He lived in a society that viewed other races as savages, and the lower rungs of society, again the poor, as inferior to the higher, the wealthy aristocrats. Remember, women, both poor and wealthy, were always inferior to the men of equal social status. With those views informing his way of thinking, he sought to find scientific support for them. That is, he wanted to explain how these features of society weren't arbitrary, but natural. Remember, the world of Galton was one that had seen the rise of industrial capitalism that viewed poverty and inequality as a necessary byproduct of competition. Let's talk now about Galton's views on organic evolution, and in doing so, it'll help us understand the great schism in evolutionary thinking that arose shortly thereafter and how confusingly, both sides claimed Galton as their inspiration. First, we should note that Darwin saw two kinds of variation in nature. The slight variation, what he just called variation, and the large variation, which he called sports. We might now think of, some, of a sport as something like a chromosome rearrangement, some kind of major shift in character as opposed to simple base substitutions. Darwin concluded that these sports were often bad and so would rarely be of any use to natural selection. He thus focused on the slight variations. Galton, however, thought these slight variations were useless in evolution due to his own discovery of a phenomena called regression to the mean. Galton wanted to apply statistical methods to his data on human variation, and this included collecting large census data and searching for various trends. One trend that he found was a general tendency each generation for the children of parents with traits of extreme values relative to the population mean to more resemble the mean phenotype of the population instead of the extremes of their parents. He called this tendency regression to the mean, and to understand it, let's imagine a simple hypothetical. Let's say I give a pop quiz to 1,000 students on a topic they know nothing about. The quiz is true-false, so each student has a 50% chance of getting any question correct. Thus, we expect there should be an average grade of 50. However, by chance, some students will do much better. Let's say 10 students got scores of 95 or above, an extreme value relative to the mean score. Now, we take those 10 students and we give them a second true-false exam that they, again, also know nothing about. The mean score is expected in the second test to also be 50%. Thus, those same students who did well by chance in the first exam do much worse in the second. They regress to the mean. If you've taken even introductory statistics, the concept of regression should be familiar to you. We've all had to perform linear regression by hand at some point in time, which is expressed by the y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is some constant. In Galton's view, these slight variations were mere statistical deviations from the mean that each generation would regress and thus couldn't be acted upon by natural selection. Instead, only large variations, the so-called sports, were important in evolution, making evolution discontinuous instead of continuous or gradual as Darwin thought it would be. We know today that regression to the mean is not an impediment to evolution because variants are not random deviates each generation, but are discrete units that remain and hence can spread and actually shift the mean. He expanded his view of heredity by proposing, first in 1876 and then in revised version over the next two decades, his Law of Ancestral Heredity. This idea sought to capture the contribution to descendant generations from all preceding ones. That is, it wanted to mathematically assess how many of your traits come from your great-great-grandfather on your mother's side, for example. The theory went that parents each contribute 50% of their traits, grandparents contribute 25%, great-grandparents 12.5%, etc. 
the contribution from each line of descendants sums to 1. Obviously, the law of ancestral heredity implies that the contribution of the present generation wanes the further back in time we go. For example, the contribution of someone 10 generations ago would be only 0.09%. Galton's intellectual descendants took different lessons from his work, and these different lessons would spawn the infamous Darwinists versus Mendelian debates that raged from 1890 to about 1910. During these 20 years, the animosity between these two camps were so strong that progress on evolutionary theory effectively ground to a halt. The Darwinists, who were also called biometricians, uh, headed by the statistician Carl Pearson and the naturalist Raphael Weldon, focused on applying statistical techniques to understanding evolution with a special emphasis on Galton's law of ancestral heredity. They thought Galton was mistaken as to the role of natural selection and viewed that it could act on continuous variation, as Darwin did, and thought it would be very slow and gradual, as Darwin had proposed. Weldon, who worked predominantly with shore crabs, was one of the first naturalists to investigate the action of natural selection on continuous variation in wild populations. This school of thinking were some of the first to wear the mantle Darwinians, and hence the phrase Darwinism generally refers to these thinkers. To define it clearly, Darwinism is the school of thought that evolution proceeds by natural selection acting on incredibly slight continuous variation and that this occurs exceptionally slowly and gradually. The opposing side was led by William Bateson, who took from Galton's work the importance of discontinuous evolution, that it mostly proceeded via sports instead of small continuous variation. He published on this subject in 1894, almost a decade before the rediscovery of Mendel's laws. The idea of discontinuous evolution received considerable support by Hugo de Vries, who was one of the geneticists to first rediscover Mendel's work, as well as to put forward his own theory of evolution in 1905 that he called the mutation theory. Both Bateson and de Vries saw Mendelian inheritance, with its focus on discrete units of inheritance instead of on continuous traits, as vindicating their ideas of discontinuous evolution. With the power of hindsight, we can see that each of these groups had elements of things we now view as part of evolutionary theory. We accept the biometrician perspective that statistics is important in evolution. Sewell Wright would later state that evolution is first and foremost concerned with the statistical situation of the species. We accept that natural selection also acts on continuous variation. We also accept that the Mendelian position, that mutations provide the raw material for evolution, and that Mendelian inheritance is true. But since these views were divided into these two camps that became increasingly hostile to one another, they could not be synthesized into a single coherent theory of evolution until people literally started to just die off. Here we are, the dawn of the 20th century. Darwin's theory of natural selection has been part of the public conscious for 40 years, and Mendel's laws of inheritance have just been rediscovered, providing, at long last, the answer to the outstanding question of heredity. And yet, a bitter dispute was brewing that would stunt the merger of these two important ideas, a dispute that began with Galton and the two schools of thinking that he spawned, the Darwinians and the Mendelians. The most antagonistic character was William Bateson. According to Beatrice Bateson, his wife, who would write a biography of him, Will was unpopular among the boys when he was in school, meaning he was often alone, and this was caused, quote, probably by his intense and emotional sensitiveness, combined with an unusually alert critical faculty. Bateson wrote a letter to his mother while at preparatory school in rugby, quote, Is anyone happy? I don't think I shall be. You will say, this is all morbid nonsense, but it is true. I never get on with anybody for long. At home, even, I am always in some scrape except when I am alone. And please don't write back that I am foolish in that, and then not tell me how to cure it.
Bateson first met Raphael Weldon at St. John's College in 1883, where Weldon was teaching invertebrate zoology. Remember, Weldon is the Darwinian disciple of Galton who worked on shore crabs. At the time, Bateson and Weldon grew close, with Beatrice describing Weldon as Bateson's, quote, most intimate friend. But perhaps the animosity between them was already brewing, as Bateson would later state that he was, quote, often made to feel like Weldon's bottle washer. I should share a funny story about how Will and Beatrice came to be married. They were first engaged in 1889, but apparently Bateson had gotten so drunk at the engagement party that Beatrice's parents forbid the wedding. So they dated for another seven years, only to get married after her father had died and could no longer voice his disdain. At St. John's, young Bateson no doubt would have gotten lectures from Weldon on biometrics, the application of statistical methods to the understanding of heredity, as well as the slow, gradual, and continuous nature of evolution and Darwinian selection. But while there, he also studied under William Keith Brooks, who in 1883 published The Law of Heredity, which proposed a theory of heredity that allowed for discontinuous evolution and saltational changes, something that Weldon and the early Darwinians strictly stated couldn't happen. Bateson spent many hours talking with Brooks, and these undoubtedly had a major impact on his thinking about the discontinuity of evolution. In 1889, Galton published Natural Inheritance, in which he strongly supported the notion of discontinuous evolution via sports. Bateson read Natural Inheritance with great excitement, and would later write of Galton, quote, "...the novelty of his thoughts and the freshness of his outlook on nature are not to be found in any other living writer, so far as I know. I often remember the thrill of pleasure with which I first read Hereditary Genius and the earlier chapters of Natural Inheritance." In 1894, Bateson published a massive tome titled Materials for the Study of Variation Treated with a Special Regard to Discontinuity in the Evolution of Species. In it, he presented almost 900 cases of what he thought were evolutionary discontinuities. Both Galton and T.H. Huxley wrote to Bateson praising the work. Huxley even stated, quote, I see you are inclined to advocate the possibility of considerable saltists on the part of Dame Nature and her variations. I always took the same view, much to Mr. Darwin's disgust, and we used to often debate it. But Weldon, Bateson's old teacher, was not impressed. He first wrote a private letter to Bateson in February of 1894, in which he expressed concerns that Galton was a good deal mixed on the continuity of evolution in natural inheritance, and that these sports that Bateson was observing were just extremes that would themselves regress to the mean. Following this private letter, Weldon would also write a public review of Bateson's book later in March, and while first praising it as an important work that everybody should read, he then pivoted to heavily criticize Bateson's views of discontinuous variation and recommended that he abandon that position and adopt the statistical approach to evolution used by the Darwinians. Given Bateson's temperament, we can only conclude this was the beginning of what would become a heated public controversy. On top of Weldon's review, which must have stung coming from Bateson's old teacher, the book sold poorly, just salt in the wound. The first public controversy following Weldon's scathing review of Bateson's book started at a meeting of the Royal Society in 1895, in which botanist Thistleden Dreyer presented research on both wild and cultivated Cineraria, a bright purple flower native to the Canary Islands. Dreyer claimed that the cultivated form was produced from wild type by artificial selection on continuous differences. He described the evolutionary process as, quote, one of continuous adjustments of slight variations on one side and the other. Bateson, who wasn't at the meeting but nevertheless read the article, immediately went to work to try to disprove Dreyer's claim. He poured through the horticultural records and came to the conclusion that Dreyer was wrong. The cultivated Cineraria had not emerged from artificial selection on slight variation, but was actually a hybrid between two distinct species and thus had emerged via discontinuous evolution. 
Bateson's rebuttal would set off a chain of back and forths in the journal Nature, first between Dreyer and Bateson, and then between Bateson and Weldon, who joined the argument to claim that Bateson had misrepresented the, horti the horticultural data by purposefully omitting some records that contradicted his case. He wrote, quote, All I wish to show is that the documents relied upon by Mr. Bateson do not demonstrate the correctness of his views, and that his emphatic statements are simply of want of care in consulting and quoting the authorities referred to. Bateson was enraged, thinking that Weldon had made a personal attack on him. The two decided to meet in person to discuss the matter, but Bateson came away with the impression that Weldon was simply playing politics. He felt that Weldon knew Dreyer was wrong and that the flower was a cultivated hybrid, but had come to his aid anyway because it helped his cause. Weldon was equally unimpressed with the meeting. He wrote to Bateson three days later, quote, Dear Bateson, I can do no more. First, you accuse me of attacking your personal character, and when I disclaim this, you charge me with a dishonest defense of someone else. I have throughout discussed only what appeared to me to be facts, relating to a question of scientific importance. If you insist upon regarding any opposition to your opinions concerning such matters as a personal attack upon yourself, I may regret your attitude, but I can do nothing to change it. Yours very truly, W.F.R. Weldon. The point and counterpoint between Dreyer and Bateson continued for over ten letters before the journal Nature refused to publish anymore. They had devolved by that point into mere posturing and polemics. Dreyer wrote, quote, I think that in the study of evolution, we have had enough and to spare of facile theorizing. I infinitely prefer the sober method of Professor Weldon, even if it should run counter to my own prepossessions, to the barren dialectic of Mr. Bateson. Bateson, never to be outdone, responded, quote, The facts I have been able to collect may have been few, but by a study of the writings of my antagonist, I have not been able to add materially to their number. For the record, Bateson would ultimately enlist Richard Lynn, who was the curator of the Cambridge University Botanical Garden, to carry out a series of crosses, the results of which were published in 1900, and showed clearly that the cultivated Cineraria had indeed arisen via hybridization, vindicating Bateson. Their next major kerfuffle would lead to what amounted to a hostile takeover. In 1893, Galton and Weldon had petitioned the Royal Society to let them establish and lead a committee on the study of evolution. The Evolution Committee, as it became known, was initially focused solely on the biometric school of thought, with their first reports penned by Weldon, including a critique of discontinuous evolution. However, the committee soon came under accusation of bias, that it was refusing to permit differing opinions. Galton, who was sympathetic to both sides, requested Weldon and Carl Pearson to consider admitting Bateson into the group. They initially vehemently refused, knowing that as a member, Bateson would only throw the committee into chaos. I should here give you a little background on Carl Pearson. It's a name you should know, and if you've taken an introductory statistics class, you've used several of the methods he developed. Pearson was a brilliant statistician, uh, introducing concepts such as standard deviation, chi-squared test, regression and correlation coefficients, the concept of p-value, and principal component analysis, often simply called PCA. He was also likely the first person to ever use a histogram. Uh, he was a staunch atheist, a socialist who advocated for women's suffrage, and gave lectures on Karl Marx while also being a horrific eugenicist, being trained under Galton, and even advocated in his 1901 work National Life from the Viewpoint of Science that the Aryan race should utterly wipe out the inferior races. Importantly, he argued that this would not only be good, but that it was natural, that in doing so, it would be letting natural selection mold a better society, while evil in the moment would ultimately lead to greater good. I won't read you any excerpts from this work because it's just so abhorrent, but it's freely available if you want to read it for yourself. You'll see very clearly that Pearson is speaking as an authority of science. He claims at several points in the essay that he is merely stating facts. 
Like with Galton, Pearson was one of the most respected evolutionary biologists of his time. He was offered both a knighthood as well as a membership to the most excellent order of the British Empire, both of which he refused because of his socialist politics. In March 2007, a conference was held in London to celebrate the 150th year of his birth. That's right, as late as 2007, we were celebrating a man who literally advocated for the genocide of other races. I hope you feel yucky the next time you must calculate Pearson's correlation coefficient. So back to the evolution committee. Weldon and Pearson eventually relented, allowing Bateson and several others to join, and within weeks, as Weldon predicted, the committee had descended into chaos. Pearson, only a month after Bateson joined, wrote to Galton that the committee was utterly unsuited to study evolution. He wrote, quote, it is far too large, contains far too many of the old biological type, by which he meant classical naturalists, and is far too unconscious of the fact that the solutions to these problems are, in the first place, statistical, and in the second place, statistical, and only in the third place, biological. When Bateson received a grant in 1897 to begin breeding experiments with the intention of pushing the committee towards more empirical applications instead of strictly statistical, Pearson and Weldon responded by attempting to just disband the committee outright. In 1899, Weldon told Bateson he thought the committee was, quote, a mistake. The whole affair led to Galton resigning in January of 1900, whose resignation was followed immediately by Pearson and Weldon. The Darwinists were certain that the committee would collapse without them, but Bateson managed to keep it alive and actually shifted its focus to align with his own, and thus Will Bateson had wrested control of the Evolution Committee and its funding structure from the Darwinist that had founded it. But that's not all. Bateson then proceeded to do one of the most underhanded things you can do in science. In 1899, Pearson had worked out his theory of homotypopsis, which I'm not even going to go into because it was totally wrong and doesn't matter. The important thing for us is that he presented the theory to the Royal Society meeting, in which Bateson was in attendance and who had already begun to write up a critical response. Pearson had intended to submit the paper to the Royal Society for publication, only to find out that Bateson had been appointed as one of the reviewers. Bateson, ever the firebrand, told Pearson at the meeting that he was going to give it unfavorable marks. However, before the other members of the review board had even gotten a chance to see Pearson's paper, Bateson circulated his own criticism to them. Irrespective of how wrong Pearson was, this is wildly unacceptable behavior, and if it had happened today, Bateson would have been banned from the society. When Pearson found out, he was furious, and he wrote to the society expressing his disdain with Bateson's actions. The entire affair poisoned the Royal Society in the minds of Pearson and Weldon, and they decided that the only way they'd be able to publish fairly without Bateson's interference was to start their own journal. In 1901, they founded Biometrica, and the first volume included Pearson's response to Bateson's criticism of his homotypopsis theory, just after Weldon published his own criticism of Mendelian inheritance. Bateson did plead with Pearson in the midst of their dispute to accept Mendelian inheritance. He saw it correctly as the answer that naturalists had been seeking all this time, and he knew that Pearson would make a powerful ally if he could just see the evidence in front of him. But by this point, the animosity ran deep, and Pearson was fiercely loyal to his friend Weldon, who was Bateson's mortal enemy. He wrote to Bateson, quote, I think sometimes you cannot be aware that Weldon has been, for many years past, one of my closest and most valued friends that I do not readily make friends, and that when I say a man is my friend, I mean that I have tested the strength of his affection in the graver matters of life, and am prepared to do for him and to accept from him anything that one human being can or will do for another. Pearson assured Bateson that he would allow him to publish in Biometrica if he so chose to submit his work there, 
but it's clear from his letter that he would not budge on the issue of Mendelian inheritance. And not because of any scientific reason, but because of his intense loyalty to his friend. In 1902, Arthur Derbyshire, a student of Weldon's, began a series of mice breeding experiments with the initial intention to demonstrate the falsity of Mendelian inheritance. Two uncomfortable things emerged from these experiments. First, Derbyshire published results that seemed to confirm Galton's law of ancestral heredity, but Bateson, upon pressing Derbyshire about the trials, got Derbyshire to admit that he hadn't correctly categorized purebred dominance from hybrids, thus invalidating the entire study. Second, Bateson explained to Derbyshire how this work had actually supported Mendelian inheritance, showing the exact ratios that were expected under Mendelian inheritance. This placed Derbyshire in a predicament. The lad was Weldon's student and relied on him for funding, but yet he'd clearly uncovered Mendel's laws right here in the very mouse experiment that was supposed to overturn them. Furthermore, he was afraid that if he didn't publicly support Mendelian inheritance, Bateson would expose his fraud. He wrote to Bateson, quote, I hope you will do your best to get me out of the position I am in as soon as possible, and I pray you not mention this letter to anyone. What do you suggest? I don't mind your saying what you like about the interpretations and conclusions in the mouse paper, but to have my records discredited would be heartbreaking and render it useless and a waste of time for me to go on with the costly experiments I am carrying out now." Bateson did not make it public, and Derbyshire himself would set the record straight in a follow-up paper in which he retracted his previous statement and showed that his studies on mice clearly demonstrated Mendelian inheritance. He would go on to become a respected Mendelian geneticist and wrote an important book on the topic in 1911 titled Breeding and the Mendelian Discovery. In this book, he expressed his regret at having studied under Weldon. Of course, Weldon and Pearson were both angered by the retraction by Derbyshire, feeling that Derbyshire had betrayed them and was himself just switching sides. And I think this is one of those moments that clearly demonstrates the point that I'm trying to make, that science has this deeply political underpinning, that Derbyshire couldn't just go with the results. He couldn't just follow what the experiments had shown him because they contradicted what his advisor wanted him to show. He was afraid that he would lose his job, he would lose his funding if he didn't support what his advisor had hired him to do. And this had put him in a very scary predicament, a predicament not merely of scientific importance, but of just his own livelihood. The last great rumble of the Mendelians and the Darwinians occurred in the most public fashion in 1904 at the meeting of the British Association. Bateson had by this time amassed an army of Mendelians who all presented their work, one after the other, a fiery challenge to the dying light that was the school of the Darwinists. We of course know how history played out and that we know Mendel's laws work, and we know that inheritance truly is particulate, and so of course Bateson was able to amass researchers that supported him. But at the time when there was still a question in the minds of some, the meeting must have been heartbreaking for the Darwinians. I want to quote Reginald Punnett at length here, who wrote of the affair in 1950 in a retrospective piece on the history of genetics. He wrote, quote, We adjourned for lunch, and on resuming, found the room packed as tight as it could hold. Even the window sills were requisitioned, for the word had gone round there was going to be a fight. Weldon spoke with voluminous and impassioned eloquence, beads of sweat dripping from his face, and I cannot help recalling the admiring remark made by one young Oxford man to another as they sat just in front of me, clever beggar that, he hasn't got to stop and think. Bateson replied, and there may have been other speakers, I have forgotten. But towards the end, Pearson got up, and the gist of his remarks was to propose a truce to the controversy for three years, after which the protagonist might meet again for further discussion. 
On Pearson, resuming his seat, the chairman, the Reverend T.R. Stebbing, a mild and benevolent-looking little figure for a great Carsonologist, rose to conclude the discussion. In a preamble, he deplored the feelings that had been aroused, and assured us that as a man of peace, such controversy was little to his taste. We all began fidgeting at what promised to be a tame conclusion to so spirited a meeting, especially when he came to deal with Pearson's suggestion of a truce. But we need not have been anxious, for the Reverend Mr. Stebbing had in him the markings of a first-rate impresario. You have all heard, he said, what Professor Pearson has suggested. And then, with a sudden rise in his voice, but what I say is let them fight it out. And on that note, the meeting ended. Bateson's generalship had won all along the line, and thenceforth there was no danger of Mendelism being squelched out through apathy or ignorance. In 1906, Two years after the meeting, and a year before the end of Pearson's proposed three-year truce, Raphael Weldon died. Pearson was heartbroken, writing that in his final days, Weldon raged against the Mendelians in stronger language than he had ever before seen him use. Weldon's death washed the taste of conflict from Pearson's mouth, and while he published a few more critiques of Mendelian inheritance afterward, he never again entered into the heat of battle. In 1906, the Biometric School, which had long supported Darwinian natural selection, acting on continuous variation, had been defeated by the Mendelians. Perhaps at no other point in history was Darwin's theory so close to being discarded as it was at that time. Hugo de Vries' mutation theory of evolution now seemed vindicated. Heredity was particulate, not continuous or blending, and the only way to change it is through mutation. What use was there for Darwinian selection? The answer was already staring the Mendelians in the face as early as 1902, but everyone was so wrapped up in the debate about Mendel's laws versus Galton's law of ancestral heredity that it was ignored. The great statistician Udny Yule, who contributed to our understanding of the discrete power law, which now bears his name, as well as extensive work in correlation and regression statistics, wrote a paper in 1902 that showed how Mendelian genetics could be reconciled with the idea that traits appeared to be continuous. Sometimes science moves slowly, uh, kicking and screaming against the tide as personality cults clash and refuse to compromise and accept when they're wrong. But sometimes, science moves at warp speed. While in 1910, few geneticists accepted Darwinian selection as an important force in evolution, by 1918, virtually all of them did. And in the 1920s, three giants of evolutionary biology, R.A. Fisher, Sewell Wright, and J.B.S. Haldane, formally unified Mendelian inheritance and Darwinian selection. Their unification thus created a new kind of Darwinism, a neo-Darwinism, as it became known, to distinguish their view of evolution which accepted Mendelian inheritance from the Darwinists who had rejected it. The neo-Darwinian synthesis, or the modern synthesis as Julian Huxley called it, was of course not the final word on evolutionary theory, and central assumptions such as the supremacy of natural selection would become hotly contested in the 1960s. But what I think clearly emerges from the history presented here is that evolutionary theory, like all fields of science, was colored by politics and personalities, that it was born through a clash of ideas that were only able to be unified by the next generation of biologists who weren't as deeply entrenched in the animosity of the prior. Often in science, a, a sort of meta-narrative emerges that science is about following the evidence, about putting aside your biases and engaging nature objectively. But this historiography is quite stunted. Again, my point is not that science doesn't discover truth or that truth is just a social construct, but rather that truth is very rarely arrived at cleanly. 
that science progresses in fits and starts, and that an ugly fact rarely kills a beautiful theory in one stroke. Often, beautiful theories don't die until they are drowned under a sea of ugly facts, and often until their proponents are themselves in the dirt. I want to emphasize here that these sorts of interpersonal conflicts and obstinance towards conflicting data isn't just a matter of historical interest. Scientists today are just like they were in the 1920s. That is, they're human. Every one of us has a history of cultural and societal grooming that preceded our initiation into scientific thinking, and none of us are immune to these implicit biases. But in conclusion, I want to caution against this knee-jerk reaction that scientists must behave like blank slates, that we should approach a problem without any social or political baggage. Our worldview permit us differing ways of thinking about data interpretation and how to articulate questions about nature. A team of scientists with different cultural backgrounds will bring with them a diversity of questions and ideas about how to approach a problem, and it is this creativity that is fundamental to the scientific process. In the end, the only thing that each of these scientists need to agree upon is the scientific method itself, its commitment to methodological naturalism, empiricism, and rationalism. But these things don't inform what questions we find interesting to ask or the angle we approach answering those questions. Thanks so much for being here. I hope I've challenged your ideas about how science progresses and illuminated the fact that science is a social institution populated by humans with egos, fears, ambitions, and passions, just like all other humans. These ambitions help us and hurt us. They hinder scientific progress and yet are central to it. In no way is this video a call for reinventing science or even a call for people to be more aware of their biases. It wouldn't matter anyway. It's more about addressing a specific historical narrative that has proliferated unchecked for quite long enough. I hope you enjoyed the journey. If you want to learn more about these fascinating historical figures, I highly recommend Will Provine's 1972 book, The Origin of Theoretical Population Genetics, from which most of this information is pulled. If you enjoy what I do here, hit like and subscribe, drop me a comment if you have questions or disagreements, and I'll catch you next time.